This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. If you want to become a patron, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at where did the road go? Dot com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? This is our Fringe News edition, and I am joined by Adam Sane of Conspiranormal. Hello, everybody. It's and been a long time. I haven't been on in a while. That's true. Have you been on since you visited? You've been on at least once, right? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think I have, actually, because huh. I've been pretty much like every, usually do these on Friday nights, and I'm usually working that night. So. Yeah, that's true. And Melissa Martell, and I, I, I forget the, I know your show's ESP, is it Extrasensory? Mm-hmm. Productions, yeah. Productions, okay. Yeah, that's me. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, so we're going to cover some uh, some fairly recent news stories. One I talked about on the show with Peter Robbins and promised we would get to on the Fringe News article. And it's uh, from the British Psych... Actually, you know what? Before we do that, let's uh, let's take a few moments to talk about Art Bell. Yeah. Because he passed away uh, on the 13th, Friday the 13th. And uh, that it, I found out about it right after we had finished doing one of the shows that aired recently, so I just kind of left a comment in the beginning. Um, but what do you, what are you guys' thoughts on art and, and his passing Adam? I, I, it was kind of shocking, honestly. I mean, I know that the guy was, but what was he in his early seventies? Uh, but 72, you don't, I think. Yeah. You don't really see, I mean, a lot, well, you know, I guess I based this on Peter, but there's a lot <laughs> of really spry 70 year olds these days. You know, what do they say? Like seventies, the new 40. But, uh, you, you know, I hadn't really, I hadn't really heard anything from him in a while, honestly. And then just to hear that he, that he died was just kind of a, just, it was really kind of out of the blue. Yeah. And of course this was right when, you know, the whole uh, bombing Syria thing was going on. So yeah. it was really kind of a busy, a busy news night. And, uh, just incidentally, it kind of happened in threes again, right? Because, uh, people also didn't notice that uh, Milos Forman died, the Czech film director. You know, okay. he did One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Amadeus, oh, yeah. uh, Man on the Moon, uh, R. Lee Ermey, which, you know, was famous from uh, Full Metal Jacket. Yep. You know, yes, he passed a- right. He passed away. But, yeah, we talked about this. Uh, we talked about this on Conspiracy Normal. We talked about Art Bell and some of the interesting things that he would do. We played the Area 51 call that he had uh we we were trying to figure out whether or not he had set that up or not mm. uh you know what i'm talking about the guys supposedly calling from the phone booth and saying that uh, they'll they'll triangulate on this position soon and um he was <laughs> apparently art lost the transponder or something and yeah yeah what, you know like whether he had set whether he you know whether he'd set those kind of things off uh or set set them up rather so yeah, uh, and also talk about some like weird retirements that he had done. Like he he retired from radio like several times, yes. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like he did coast to coast like at least two times that I know of. And then the latest thing was the midnight in the desert thing, which well, you know if- we're both on dark matter uh, yes. that network, and that was set up for Art Bell. That it was, yeah, yeah. Uh, um. The, the both times he retired, I think there was some, if I remember when he came back, he, he did a long talk about what happened in the past and why he wasn't going to do coast to coast again. Um, and I think it revolved around, there were some allegations thrown at him that turned out not to be true, but they didn't back him and they just kind of dropped him. Um, yeah. and he decided to go back anyway. And when he went back, he said that he was really upset with the sheer number of ads that were being run on the show like half the show was advertisement which is about right about yep. uh 20 out of the you know 20 minutes of ads 20 plus minutes of ads and about 40 minutes of content 
uh, and he wanted less ads, and he got to a, he said he got to a big you know back and forth with them, and eventually he walked away from it. Um, and then he came on to Sirius, and Sirius, his big thing is not he didn't have the the listenership he had on FM on AM radio, um, right? Which is understandable. Not everyone has Sirius. A lot of people got Sirius to listen to art, but it wasn't the same. And he wanted them to put out some kind of uh, some free content like they wanted he wanted to be able to stream it on the website so people everyone could hear it and they were going no you don't understand that's not how this works this is about us making money off having you on the station and so he backed out of that and then yeah went to dark matter and then claimed his uh his life was being threatened and walked away from it yeah Yeah. i i I think that that aspect of him quitting all those times it was one of those things that made him really controversial yeah. A kind of a, a real controversial figure. And plus also, you know, was he doing these kind of theater of the mind things, um, such as not only that Area 51 call, but the guy flying over Area 51 and Bell's Hole and all right. these kind of things that he, oh, uh, he was, some he was, people suspect that he was a showman and he set all that, he set all that stuff up. I have no doubt that he was a showman. He was out there to entertain. Yeah. I mean, yes, he had yes. interesting subjects and he did interesting stuff, but he was an entertainer as well. And Melissa, we right. keep cutting you off, so go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> you know, I hadn't ever listened to Art Bell when he was on radio. I came across him a few years ago on, on with YouTube, old videos from Coast to Coast or Dark Matter, and um, I really loved his interview that he did with George Letts of um, the Amityville Horror. It was whether or not you, it was a hoax or not. It was an interesting interview. I think it was, it was just nice. It was like, I'm not really interrupted. I mean, maybe a few commercials, but it's, I don't know. It gave you a, a different insight into yeah, George Lutz as a person rather than just that Amityville horror stuff. But I was surprised. I didn't. I didn't know a lot about Art Bell. Um, I was sad to have the news. It was surprising. But um, what was it somebody was posting? He was. He's a, a skeptic. I'm not going to say his name, but he's quite a skeptic in this sort of field. And he writes a lot of books. He's well known. He gets a lot of TV time. But he was mentioning something really critical about Art Bell um, to do with that. It was some kind of cult hail bop or. That was something the heaven, oh, heaven yeah, the skate, heaven skate. yeah. It's the yeah. heaven skate. That's what it was, and he was really like, like basically, like, oh well, like it was pretty, like um, he's responsible for the death of da 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 da, and I was like, right. oh, geez, and um, I was, I was unaware of that, but he seemed like he was posting this on. I, I always believe if someone dies, you say their condolences, and you start saying, well, he killed all these people, and I, I wasn't when I read That's, about it. I, I'm not quite sure he's directly responsible for the death of all those people. I didn't really buy that. that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty not unfair. A, it's not a yeah, new I accusation thought, either. No, uh, I thought that was really unfair, an unfair call. And it, I was like, the, well, it, I'm that's not. it's similar to how I mean, Sarai, you know this. Like those kids that killed themselves for the Judas Priest album. Yeah, well, that you was know, how, how, how can you how can you be you know how can you really be responsible for? I mean, if if people want to be idiots and kill themselves, then you know that's just how it's just how it goes. Well, well, the difference you there can't is, police everything that you say. No, absolutely not. The difference being though that he was he was kind of fueling this whole. Uh, you know, there's a spaceship behind Hell Bop, et cetera, et cetera, that the Heaven Gate mm-hmm. cult was latching on to. Um, and it was just, you know, people just felt that he maybe was, was being irresponsible for the sake of but, entertainment. But again, you know. How do you know? How do yeah. you, like, maybe he didn't take that very serious. Like, maybe he didn't realize the level of control that they, that, that, we, I don't know what the leader of the cult's name was, but. I, uh, I, I, Bo, I guess Bo, it, was Bo it was Bowen Peep. It was Bowen Peep. Marshall uh, Applewhite was his real yeah. name. Right. Marshall Applewhite. But it's like, you know, he, he probably just saw it as another topic to talk about or highlight rather that, you know, rather than, oh, yeah, I'm going to lead all these people to their deaths. <laughs> yeah. Like for all he knew, it could have been some kind of hippie commune that just was like, uh, just talking stuff. It's It's hard to know. Yeah, and it, it's easy to say in hindsight, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, but you know, I mean, he's he is the one that that kind of, <laughs> no pun intended, set the bar. Um, 
for <laughs> all of this stuff. You know, he he was he is the guy who pushed who who got this type of material on the on late night radio into the <laughs> semi mainstream. Uh, as yeah. someone said, even people who don't listen to this stuff know who Art Bell was. Yes. Right. And if not for Art Bell, you know, you we would not be doing what we're doing. Well, we might be, but it wouldn't be the same. It might have taken longer yeah. for it to, to, to build up. It would probably be done differently. I mean, he, like I said, he kind of like, he, he set the template. Yes. Yep. So. Yeah, he, re- he really did. I mean, it's a very unfortunate loss. Absolutely. Okay. All right, let's move on to this. And this comes from, again, I talked, to, talked about uh, this briefly when I had Peter Robbins on. From the British Psychology Society Research Digest, uh, our brains rapidly and automatically process opinions when we agree with as if they are facts. <laughs> facts, and, yeah. <laughs> and this should not surprise anyone, really, if you think about it. Um, but they've actually been able to, uh, uh, let's see, let me read one of the, the ways they did this. Uh, and the researchers created a variation of, of a task that required participants to indicate whether statements, coriander is tasty, coriander is disgusting, indicated something positive or negative. For statements that they agreed with, participants were faster to answer yes whether they were identifying with that statement as positive or identifying that it was negative. The researchers said this confirms that we have a rapid involuntary cognitive basis for answering in the affirmative to semantic questions about opinion statements that we agree with, ruling out effects of fluency or unfamiliarity that might have confounded the results for judging the grammatical grammar of statements in the earlier studies. Um, the current findings suggest that despite adults' understanding of the notion of subjectivity, they may react to opinion incongruent statements as if they are factually incorrect. So if you hear something um, that you don't agree with, you, you naturally lean toward thinking it's just not true. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the distinction between factual truths and opinions held to be true is pivotal for rational discourse. However, this distinction may apparently be somewhat murky within human psychology. And I think that is preyed upon by all sides of the news media at this point. I mean, anyone who has an agenda knows this and is freely, you know, working that with people. Right. So you can just state your opinion as fact. And well, it's fact as long as you agree with it. Yeah, as long as you, yeah. And, and once you know your audience and what they believe, that's easy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you see that all the time. You see the, the same storyline um, in the Washington Post. You see it posted two different ways depending on who they think is going to be reading it. But it's the exact same story. <laughs> uh, they also uh, talk about the Stroop effect in the article. Um, how we're slower to think the uh, the name of ink col. <laughs> Let me try and read this again. How we're slower to name the ink color of color denoting words when the word doesn't match the ink, like red written in blue ink. The Stroop effect occurs because our brains rapidly and involuntarily process the color meaning of the word, which interferes with our processing of the ink color. Oh. And if you've ever seen that, it does kind of mess with you a little bit. So you'll see red written in blue, and you're going, wait, what? What? But that's actually <laughs> visually blue. <laughs> yeah, there's a little and conflict said, there. Um, and I said a while back, psychologists showed there's a similar phenomenon for facts. They called it the epistemic, oh my God, I cannot talk tonight, epistemic Stroop effect. We're quicker to verify that factual then non-factual statements are spelled correctly, suggesting that our rapid discernment of factual accuracy, accuracy interacts with our judgment about spelling, even though the factual accuracy of the statements is irrelevant to the spelling task, and I'm guilty of that. Like, if I see something written poorly, I'm thinking, all right, I don't, I don't know if I, I, I'm going to go with that. Because, oh, yeah, it's kind of yeah. like those, it's kind of like those websites where everything's all capital letters and misspelled. Yeah. You're just like, oh no, I don't, I don't think that I buy any of this, <laughs> even though there might be a grain of truth in there. Or it you might still, be completely you, you're true. still not gonna, yeah, you still, you, you're still not gonna look at it because it's poorly written and looks like it's done by a crazy person. 
Well, that, <laughs> that, that, that my, I think my brain says, well, if you, you don't know the difference between here and here or, or whatever, you know, it's like even little things like that, it's like, okay. Oh, yeah. You're clearly not someone I should be listening to. I, well, I, well, that's every day on Facebook. I always connect like good grammar to somebody who's gone through education and writing and stuff. So when I uh-huh. see it really poorly, I'm like, okay, well, do they know actually how to research? And so I, I do question it as well, just because I have I connect that to somebody who spent time, you know, educating themselves and developing their writing skills. And and the <laughs> truth is, you can have someone who's very educated but has no idea what they're talking about, but they can write it out really nice. That's true. I've, yeah. I have I have known people who were simply not smart, but they were well spoken and charismatic. Um, yes. And you're like it, you initially think when you meet them, you're thinking, "Oh, this guy's pretty smart." Yeah. Until you really get to know them, and you're thinking, "Whoa, you're really not smart." How How did I think you were smart? And then you start realizing it was that charisma, it was the fact that they were well spoken, they were taught well growing up, so. You know, they have those characteristics. You get, you get that a lot with narcissists, you know? Yeah. Uh-huh. You know what the thing that about that those type of people is? That stuff only works quickly. After a while that you're around them, the facade starts to crack. Oh, yeah. yeah. They'll figure it out. But unfortunately, they could do a lot of damage before then. Well, yeah, it's intentionally or otherwise. Yeah. Just to say about the misspellings, I mean, if, if I could read the most uridite and... Um, important comment on somebody's post on Facebook, but if there is spelled wrong, depending on the usage, uh-huh. then you know, you know, it, it it just it just takes it down a little bit of a notch psychologically for me. You know what? I read an article about grammar Nazis, the kind of thing like people who are neurotic. About. It wasn't a good thing. It said something <laughs> bad about us that the people who are. Oh, I can't, I can't remember. It's driving me crazy now. It said something about the psychology of people who are, are obsessed with grammar, and it's more about them than it is about the person's grammar. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I, th- I think I know what you're talking about, actually. Yeah, I can't remember it, though, specifically. Well, I think the it's, big... all, it's also when you know the correct words and you see them wrong, used wrong, you're kind of like, oh, why are you using that wrong? You know? Yeah, it makes, it, it makes you cringe. And say, well, that was a great point, but you know, learn how to spell, and um, it, the the whole um, using large words it reminds me of uh, you remember uh, in loving in living color from the nineties of Damon Wayans' character. Oh yeah, that uh, the, the 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 guy that's in jail and he just uses all these like large words. It's just complete nonsense, but he uses yeah. large words to make himself appear educated. Yes, but he doesn't have them in the right context. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's, there's try, a lo- Go ahead. I try really hard to be nice. Like if I see bad grammar, because I'm like, well, Melissa, you've done articles and you've made mistakes, and people point out your grammar. Grammar, and I'm always happy when people point it out that I've made a mistake. <laughs> but I'm always like, okay, be nice about it, Melissa. <laughs> well, Don't there's, have there's... To trash their feelings. <laughs> Sometimes I'll read articles for the show, and I'll see uh, this is like important. This is articles from mainstream news sites, um, BuzzFeed or whoever. And they'll have just the misspellings, words missing, the worst grammar, run-on sentences. And it's like, it, 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 does anybody actually proofread anything yeah. anymore before they put it out run for, on public, sentences for publication? Bother- <laughs> yeah. Run-on sentences, I think, bother me the most because mm. it, my brain does not like to read that at all. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. stop. Stop. Yeah, like like Rojan on Project Archivist, he calls it all word salad. You yeah, know, that's yeah. exactly what it is. And and the thing is, I mean, this this is this is how subtly we interpret things, you know, on all these different levels. And so when it, again, when you look at the paranormal in relation to this stuff, and it's something we really, you know, this is stuff we know and we don't necessarily think about. How about the stuff we don't know? Hmm. You know, so like we we understand what we're doing when when he, when we you know judge someone as maybe not as smart because they spelled a bunch of r- words wrong, even though they might be brilliant. Um, but we understand that you know our yeah. perceptions are so subtle in how they work that we we don't always understand why they're doing that. And I and I think when you have 
arguments back and forth between you know the people who are closed-minded skeptics and the true believers. You have you have this is the same thing uh, that yeah. they're talking about that the brain is set to agree with the things it already believes. You know, treat them as fact. Well, and I think I think some people are more agreeable than others as well in personality, oh, yeah. and so that would just double it up. Um, but it's 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 yeah, it's what you know, and sometimes it can be embarrassing or uncomfortable to go somewhere about information that you don't know, and it's safer, you know, to stay with what what you know and discuss that and and so you don't have that that feeling of ridicule or rejection or uncomfortableness well the the other problem is that people don't always understand that what they're speaking is an opinion and that yes. that's where a lot of arguments come up because people are literally arguing over opinions not facts they're not yeah. saying here are the facts they're saying well i believe this and because i believe it it's true but they're not they're not saying it that way but that's essentially what's coming out of them um yeah. And, then, and and then all they do is fight, and that doesn't get anyone anywhere. Uh, okay. And it's it's just it becomes a frustrating thing. Someone had posted uh, Christopher Erickson posted an article that uh, Thomas Sheridan had written about uh, obsessing, obsessive. De- uh, let me try again. Obsessive debunking disorder. <laughs> and this was wow. this, this was a great article talking about how the the right and left sides of the brain interact uh not as as simply as most people do it's posted to the where the road go page and i kind of want to have thomas on to talk to him about some of this stuff because he has some interesting stuff out there um but he's saying that that part of the problem is there there is a logical side to the brain and when you get to the people who are uh actual closed-minded materialist skeptics a they pretty much want to be told what's true and not from the authorities, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and B, they don't inter- their brain isn't integrated in a way where they pick up subtleties and other things from the environment that other yes. people might. And I found that the people I know who are the diehard materialist skeptics have will say, "Well, I've never had a weird experience. If I have a a good feeling about something, it doesn't mean anything, you know." And so on and so yes. forth. And I'm thinking, you you just don't have that ability. And, yeah. it may, and it may be that it's hardwired into the brain. You know, they just don't have that ability. I find I'm conflicted between, like, the log. Like, I have a logical side that wants to be skeptical, but then I have a side that's, like, more intuitive, right, and more yeah. feeling. And I'm, like, I'm always in conflict between those two. Like, that's- I don't, like, like, I have a friend, like, we had a weird experience, and then I'll go, wow, that's really, that did happen to you. And then as soon as I hang up, this logical, skeptical side of my brain will try to find reasons why it didn't happen and and it just starts pounding down and i'm like and i'm always trying to balance them yeah Yeah, and and, and that's the healthy way to be same for me Mm. you know people will present me with something and i'll think okay and i accept you know if someone tells me they've had an experience unless there's a red flag there somewhere where i'm going okay i don't believe you because of a you know And that's usually not the case. You know, someone will tell me their story and I'll be like, I totally believe that they experienced this. But that doesn't mean it doesn't it doesn't tell me what actually happened to them, you know, and not not having been there. I can't I can't say one way or the other. You know, there's there's a few listener stories I've had on where I've been maybe one or two where I've been kind of on the fence where I'm like, I don't know if I believe this person. They could be making it up. But again, I wasn't there, and I and you know, there's there's not enough there for me to say. I'd rather I'd rather go with the presumed innocent, presumed honest, rather than assume everyone's lying. You know. Yes. So if I if I'm on the fence, I'll generally you know, put the story out there, and if not, you know, I mean, I'd rather have it out there, and and you know, if someone can can find out that it's not true, okay, whatever. But I mean, their their experiences people have, so unless they're flat out making it up. You know, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah? Were you going to say something? No, no, I said no, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's move on to, and I recommend reading that, that article on the Where the Road Go group on, uh, on the uh, obsessive debunking disorder. It's a really good article. The OPD. <laughs> <laughs> I, ha- I, feel I, ha- like I, I feel like I... I- 
I suffer from that sometimes. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> but the uh, I, I do have a friend, as I said, who uh, who fits that description to a T. And any time I tried to debate him, because he's he's not he's a very materialistic atheist. And any time right. I any time I tried to debate him, like he'll debate stuff online when he can look stuff up, and I'm like, no, 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 let's just have a conversation. He'll be like, no. Right. He's got to he's got to throw the he's got to throw all the you, you make some people you got to make sure you got your work cited page when yeah. you talk to them ready in hand. <laughs> um. Your foot, all your footnotes in order. Right, right. Um, so let's Exciting. look at this this one. We've de- we've talked about depression before, and this is t- from Psychology Today. How untreated depression changes the brain over time. Uh, a new study finds that long term depression may have neurodegenerative ne- degenerative effects. Um, years of untreated depression may lead to neurodegenerative levels of brain inflammation. That's according to the first of its kind study showing evidence of lasting biological changes in the brain for those suffering with depression for more than a decade. Um, and they're saying it can lead to things like Alzheimer's and dementia and, and things like that. And with the sheer number of people experiencing severe depression nowadays, that's, that is not a pretty picture that it paints. I'm always fascinated, um, well, I'm fascinated and troubled by... Um, not only that, um, but a lot of people like um, my grandmother and other people that I know who have been suffering from depression, um, I start to notice like uh, are also not, it's not, the brain is deteriorating and I, I see them have those signs of Alzheimer's exactly, but they've also had really traumatic childhoods mm-hmm. and and it, it, they don't just have depression, but they they also seem to have and I'm not. I can't say this across the board. I can, I'm only saying from what I've seen from relatives. They they also come down down throughout their lives with a lot of illnesses and medical problems and fibromyalgia, a uh, uh. whole bunch of other illnesses. And it's almost like they're. I'm I'm always wonder what environment is impacting on this right from the beginning when they're developing in an early age. It's like the external traumas can also change the brain or how we think can also just change the chemistry or maybe even the structure of the brain. And, and, and how you're responding to the environment and what it's, you know, especially in the early stages when you're forming your brain. I, I, I oh, don't yeah. know. I think that can be huge. And, and then that there might be a genetic component to it as well that has nothing to do with that, that you inherit it and, and that environment on top of it. But everybody that I've known who has depression and that always had traumatic childhood and they came down with like a lot of autoimmune diseases as well. And I think, I think that also has something to do with, with the idea that the, the brain or the mind can influence the body. So if there's disruption in your mind, there are things you haven't dealt with because maybe you can't, uh, it, it expresses itself through the body. Yeah, exactly. It can also be the other way around too. It could be a it could be a cycle, a yeah. circle. Oh, sure. Uh, you, you, you know, the, there's interesting aspects about like you know, feral children. You know, children that have not had any human contact. You know, it's a very rare thing. Mm-hmm. But I have read things about that to where that they have actually like smaller, like their brains are smaller. After a yeah. certain age, they're 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 not able to really pick up and pick up and learn. No. So yeah, I like the, uh, the external sim- stimuli is very important for the brain development. Well, I mean, it makes sense to me. Sure, sure, and and there's there's also something called um, emotional disconnection. And that happens when, as young children, they're not given like affection and stuff from the parents. Right. And they they never le- and those people never learn how to quite integrate their emotions. They feel emotions, but they don't show them the way uh, what you might call normal people show them. So they come off sometimes as as autistic or robotic or like they yeah. just don't care because even though those em- emotions are there, they don't incorporate them into their being. You know, they just they're kind of cordoned off and and usually very intense, but there's yeah. no expression, no outlet. 
And it's so like when you're an infant, it is so part of socializing, part of health and a baby thriving and into childhood is also touch and affection, yes. physical touch. And if you don't have that, I can see how, you know, to survive, you'd have to close off and perhaps become more resilient. And, and that might result in being, you know, appearing distant or cold or. Wasn't there an experiment I think in the 60s or 70s with monkeys where they basically took the baby monkeys away from the mothers and they raised some of them without any kind of contact at all. Yeah. Didn't and they, they did find fake, out. They gave them like a I, fake doll or something to clean. Yeah, that might have been another mm-hmm. experiment. Okay. There might have been there might have been two different ones. But it was it's something that where they actually looked at their brains afterwards and compared them to the ones that had mothers right. and they were actually smaller. Yeah. And, and so I don't know that size of the brain has as much of an effect as we, as we normally would think because you know, there, there are smarter uh, animals and stuff with smaller brains and, and dumber animals with I bigger think- brains like when they look at the brain there's areas of the brains that where that are when they map them that w- that light up at certain areas of healthy children and they don't yeah. do the same thing in probably the monkeys or whatever that right that could be or less could nurtured be. you know what maybe that i don't know cuz i've seen that before in 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 documentaries where they're looking at you know how the brain areas of the brain are actually lighting working rather as opposed to size and of course, all that gets gets a monkey wrench thrown into it when you realize there are people who, uh, and I forget the exact. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> uh, they have uh, they have no brains. Basically, it's all liquid because their brains don't form. And most of those people are vegetables, but occasionally they are perfectly normal and sometimes even geniuses. And no one knows there's a problem until after they're dead and they. You know, do an like the story I, I remember hearing. I think it was in uh, Michael Talbot's Holographic Universe. Was the coroner coming out to you know this this family he died in a car accident or whatever? And they said, "Well, I'm very sorry about your special son." And the parents went, "What do you mean special son? Like that just sounded weird. What do you mean?" And, the, and he said, "Well, I assume he was severely retarded." And he said. No, he was like on the honor roll and on all these other. And he's like, no, I'm sorry, that's impossible. He had, like, almost no gray matter. It was all liquid. Wow. So, clearly, there is more. That is very fascinating. It's, and that's not a, a singular case. That's happened a few times that has been recorded, noted. I mean, it's not, it's not like one of those wild stories you can't verify. It's out there. Um, and in which case, you have to say, what, what's really going on? Yeah, what's making people, like, what's really happening in the brain? like? And they say that, you know, we have a, a, a neural net across our abdomen that is on level with the brain. So are they relying on that? You know, is that doing more than, than what should be in their head? Is it possible to, to function like that? Yeah, the puts in question, like, gut health. And the microbiomes in your stomach. <laughs> yeah. So, Sor- Soraya, the uh, experiments that we were talking about, they actually mm-hmm. were two different ones, but could, but done by the same doctor, Harry Harlow. So, it said that uh, he did do the wire and the cloth-covered mother experiment, but it's mm-hmm. also, he said, also later in his career, he cultivated infant monkeys in isolation chambers for up to 24 months, from which they emerged intensely disturbed. I'm sure. Hmm. That's awful, is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on to something a little more, oh, let's call it entertaining. Uh, and I yeah. was going to say, too, that uh, I remember Alex Jones screaming about babies more with about brain stems. Just I thought I'd add that in there. Well, it's, it's, it's something that does happen, but most of the time those, those babies are... <laughs> It's not a conspiracy theory. <laughs> but, but most of, most of those times, those babies are basically vegetable, you know, yeah. If, yeah. if they can function at all. So it's, you know, when you have these people who are literally geniuses and they have no brain, no no functional brain, 
you have to you have to wonder what's really going on and how much of our reality is what it actually seems to be. Yeah. Uh, from the International Business Times, Devil's Letter, written by 17th century possessed nun, finally decoded thanks to dark web code. The dark web code. Now, is this possessed in quotations? Uh, As it, in, like, it, she was suspected yep. to be possessed, but actually had some well, other kind of... Devil's condition. letter is actually in quotation. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just, so, just wondering. Scientists in Italy have used a piece of code found on the dark web to decipher a 17th century letter written by a Benedict, Benedictine... Oh, my God. Benedictine. Here's, thank you. Not while she was apparently possessed by Satan. Uh, in 1676, Sister Maria, yep, I'm not even going to try. You can read the article for her full name. Woke up, <laughs> <laughs> woke up to find her face covered in ink and a letter she had penned in an incomprehensible mix of Greek, Cyrillic, Arabic, and runic languages. She and her sisters at the Palma di Monticello. Convent. That's every language that's on Soraya's metal album. <laughs> exactly. Convent in Sicily <laughs> believed the message had been delivered by a demon, but they were unable to make any sense of the text. And you have no idea how many bands. When I do the last exit for the lost, <laughs> and there are band names and and album and song titles that are in various different languages, and I just look at all the consonants and go, I don't even know where to start. Maybe, maybe this nun was ahead of her time. Maybe she was supposed to be a, a rock star. I'm, I'm still trying to get. I'm still trying to get uh, a handle on reading grindcore band names. Oh, good luck! Now, 361 <laughs> years later, a team from the Ludum Science Center in Sicily claimed to have translated 15 lines of the elusive message. What's more, they used a piece of decryption code found lurking on the dark web. Um, the parts of the devil's letter that abate and his team have translated discuss the relationship between God, mankind, and Satan. Uh, it sounds like a uh, book from, uh, who's the one that wrote all the vampire books? Anne Rice. Anne Rice, yeah. yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that one of her uh, her books? God and Satan have a conversation and Lestat uh, overhears it or whatever? Oh, I can't remember. It's been so long since I've read those. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but uh, he said... Uh, in it, Sister Maria, or whoever had possessed her, encouraged God to abandon man and leave him to the clutches of the devil. God thinks he can free mortals, it reads, adding, this system works for no one. Uh, modern historians take the view that Sister Maria suffered from schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. She was certainly a talented linguist, demonstrating a mastery of several languages and different alphabets. Uh, Bates said, my theory is that the that this is a precise alphabet invented by a nun with great care, mixing symbols she knew. Each symbol is well thought out and structured. There are signs that are, that are repeated, perhaps intentionally or perhaps unconsciously. Sister Maria is, also, is said also to have told her fellow nuns that she received two other messages from the devil, but these were never written down or revealed to another soul. Mm. So schizophrenia or mental illness... Is suspected. Yes. So. That's what they say, though. You know, we yeah. know it, what it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, I would think schizophrenia over bipolar disorder. I'm not yeah. aware of bipolar disorder creating that much of. A, I mean, unless I'm unless I'm wrong about bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is more of a mood disorder. Uh, yeah. But schizophrenia, I could see totally doing something along these lines. Yeah. I mean, uh, I know people with bipolar sure. go into manias, but they usually don't start, you know, speaking in tongues and calling. Yeah. And the woman was av obviously brilliant in order to, to, to learn all these languages. And it's just, this would be more, more suspicious if she was uh, not very well spoken, not very well read, and then she wrote all this in different languages. But to know yeah. that she was proficient in all these different languages is kind of like, okay, so the information was already there in her head. It's just, why did it come out this way? Yes. Because, I mean, she, I mean, she uses, like, 
I, I mean, I mean, they're saying she goes on about drugs, prostitution, pedophilia. So she, she I mean, oh, I no, mean, no, 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 no. That's on the dark web. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm obviously <laughs> reading something wrong. Well, that's because uh, that, okay, that's so where the paragraph starts. To decipher her in letters, I'm like, I'm reading something here. I'm like, what the heck? Yeah, it no. says they used a piece of description code found lurking on the dark web. Everything's on there: drugs, prostitution, uh, okay, pedophilia. Okay, okay, that's on the dark web. I, I thought they were talking about the nope. actual document. Sorry, I'm going through this quick. But <laughs> she, I mean, she obviously has um, a belief system already, and. Yeah. I always like my whole idea is there could be a mental illness, but there also is could be a conflict between, um, you know, natural human desires and then this belief system that you have. And you, if you've got someone who's a nun and um, is you know, not, you know, engaging in a normal marriage relationship and is devout to God, and and but then you 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 know you you mix that up against. Um, a human's natural biology and push and urge. I don't know if that would create a sort of, and then and then combine it with um, mental illness um, and and her all her education. I I I, I don't. Uh, that seems to me what's what's going to happening with a lot of people who have these belief systems of that they have to be devout and good and and clean and pure. Mm-hmm. Well, not, yeah, not, there's a lot of con- a lot of conflict there. Yeah. yeah. Not only that, but I, I fully believe that celibacy creates various types of issues. I think that it apparently prove- it did in Toronto uh, yesterday. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, let's let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> but you have, I, I I think you have a a corruption of a natural urge there, um, that can can then pervert it severely. Yeah. But there's also, I mean, if you look at at, at if you if you understand the way some some tantric practices work, you are going you could potentially end up with certain abilities, you know, like you have nuns mm-hmm. levitating and things like this that yeah. can be caused by by a overabundance of sexual energy that is being channeled into something else. Exactly, that's a really good point. So I th- I th- I think you know, and I and I've discussed this with other people. You know, you have this whole pedophile thing with the, with um, the Catholic Church. And I've had a number of people say, well, people who are pedophiles are drawn to that, you know, drawn to that type of vocation. And maybe that's true. But I also wonder if it's the, the fact that they are they're suppressing that natural sexual expression eventually mm-hmm. twists it into something else because it's being, you know, pushed yeah, down. They're, they're, they're finding whatever is available. Some yeah. of that, though, is the fact that some of those, some of those men – decide that that's that they're just going to try to hide from their urges that sexual attraction to children yeah well, and, but it too, ends yeah. but it ends up happening anyway um yes. but yeah you, you have a lot of cases, especially with nuns i think you have a lot of cases of things like mm-hmm. levitation through the years and yes. and stuff like that and that very well could be that repressed sexual energy because if you've ever done t- any kind of tantric work you realize how powerful sexual energy can be it's... yeah not only that what's one of the uh, main explanations for a poltergeist yeah yeah, yeah. it's one of them yeah Ooh. i mean i you know and, and the thing with the church is there's um we're t- like this is a, a nun and and they have um a complete they have, they have like you know the virgin mary they they have this really to me, gross idea about female sexuality, oh, and, sure. and 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 then you've got these nuns who are who are getting none, and <laughs> like I, it, <laughs> wah, wah, wah. I, uh, uh, pun, yeah. pun, pun I know, intended. I had to do that, but um, it's 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 just so like distortive, and and uh, honestly, it's almost like you're their shadow selves. Like it's it, if you don't. Uh-huh you know, acknowledge that side of you, it, it, like I said, it becomes grotesque and distorted and, and unfed and starved and pushed aside. And I, I just find it, you know, this intelligent woman um, with all this education, she's still like a part of herself is getting deformed and shoved in the back and there it comes. And that's well, how that's she does her- it out. Her intelligence is being stifled too, right? Not just yeah. her sexuality. Yeah. Well, yeah. What 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 exactly did she write about? 
So well, that that's all it says. It's just that it was the uh uh where is it? She wanted um God, God thinks to he can leave. free mortals. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, leave the mortals to be destroyed by the devil because there is no book. Oh, that's um, nice. Yeah. That's real yeah. loving. Yeah, so it's and then she wrote some other stuff down. Oh, she didn't write it down. She's she's told fellow nuns stuff, but she never wrote it down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, quick uh, quick uh, fact here, just in case you're wondering. Celibacy was never a thing in the Catholic Church until about a thousand years, over a thousand years after Christ. Right. The Eastern Orthodox allows their priests to be married. Mm-hmm. It and always so what- has. Where where did this come from? The cel- idea of celibacy. The idea of celibacy in the Catholic Church came from the fact that you didn't want priests or mainly bishops to have children to pass their land down to. Oh. In other words, the land would always stay in the church. Uh-huh. That's basically where it comes from. Yeah, I've actually now that you say that I've heard that before. Yep. Yep. Cra- that's crazy. All this yep. stuff just for, so the church can have land and power. And, yep. and, 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 and when you look at our culture now, especially in this country, you have such a repressed sexual culture. Um, and that, I think, causes more problems than, than people really understand. Because sexuality is, I mean, violence is okay, but sexuality is bad. Yeah. And it's like, what? No, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You know, you see a nipple and people freak out. But, you know, you, you see someone blown away by gunfire, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah my kids yeah. can see that, as long as they don't see a nipple, you know? Right, exactly. And and what, what, what kind of, you know, repression does that cause, as a, you know, to us as a culture? You know, and again, it, it, make, it perverts things. Well, this is our inheritance from the Puritans, okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, actually, let me ask you something, Melissa. Is it much different in Canada? Because we all kind of come from the same root. Okay. Well, you know, there are little factions of religion in Canada, but I don't think it's anything like um, like in the United States. I've, I've seen like Hutterites or Mennonites in small groups, um, but we, you know, I think most people who attend church in Canada are older and they're pretty... Um, they don't really preach. You don't really hear a lot about it. And and I, I could be just because I'm on Vancouver Island and it's different. And I, you could go to the East Coast and it could be completely different. Um, I, I don't know, but I don't see a lot of people preaching like I've seen in the United States, especially in the South. Yeah. 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 And the Bible Belt, especially. Yeah. You get that yeah. type of stuff. That's where I am. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. And so, continuing in in from that, uh, from the BBC News, uh, Exorcism, Vatican Course Opens Doors to 250 Priests. And uh, traditionally, exorcism, you know, at least in modern times, has been sort of ignored by the church, but now suddenly they're starting to embrace it, and it looks like money may at least be part of that. You know, the Mm. event costs 300 euros, uh, about three hundred seventy dollars, <laughs> and covers the theological, psychological, and anthropological background to exorcisms. Well, you know, when there's a need, I mean, they wouldn't be able to do it if people weren't asking for it, right? So I True. guess they're trying to make money. They're trying to make money, and I mean, I want I want to think also that they want to educate, you know, their their people a little, so they don't do really stupid things. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a thing in here that says that they are taught uh, psychological issues and stuff like that to to really try and root out what's going on before assuming it's an, an exorcism. Uh, and I don't know it's a longer well, that's, article. That's good. Yeah, that um, is very good. You don't want to just jump straight to exorcism. You never want to do that. Um. Unless the pea soup starts flying and the head starts turning, then you gotta. <laughs> then, you get, then you might want to do an exorcism. Do you know what's really strange about this article? It's like you you could say, well, why is it increasing? And it's like the father Gary Thomas, he talks about um, 
because people have relied heavily on social sciences, there's not as many trans exorcists. But he says, the decline of Christianity has also led to an increase in superstitious practices, he believes. I, I thought this sounded strange. Hmm. You would well, think sure. the decline of like, Christianity. I guess it depends what's pl- replacing Christianity. Well, I think they're talking about occultism, basically. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It says, Father Thomas works with a team of doctors, psychologists, and psychiatrists, all practicing Catholics, to rule out any other cause for a person's suffering before diagnosing demonic possession. It, it seems like I see this story almost like every two years or so for some odd reason. Oh, it's a, po- it's a popular theme, you know. Yeah. Just, despite the fact that the show, The Exorcist, which is excellent, by the way, is not doing very good. Um, is it still on? Yeah, it's still on. Uh, but I don't know if they're going to do a third season or not. Uh, it's, it's a very good show and it's, you know, you would think with the popularity of this subject matter, it would be doing great. I mean, how many exorcism movies are the exorcism of this person, the exorcism of that person, the exorcism, you know, (laughs) there's, there's a million of them nowadays. How many ghost hunting shows, especially like ghost adventures and stuff, you know, throw in like, you know, Oh, maybe that. Maybe no. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm thinking of those adventures with Zach being possessed. I'm sorry. I don't know how many exorcisms they've um, done. You know, it's it's sad because you would have thought that um, you know, the Christianity would be hopefully replaced by science. But I guess with the onslaught of the internet and stuff like that, it's there's a lot of more tribal stuff. So it's being replaced by these smaller factions of beliefs and ghost shows and. It's yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting that it was you know science wasn't no as influential. I, but but there yeah. are there are people who treat science as a religion. I mean that's that's the, the close minded skeptics we were talking about earlier. Sure, but they're, but, they're not uh, they're not possessed apparently. <laughs> well, <laughs> that we know I, of. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually did read a book about this uh, from a Christian author who's since passed called the Supernatural Worldview. He talked about this that it wasn't going to be science or atheism that's going to try to replace christianity that it would be some other it would be another form of spiritual belief i I don't think that materialism is strong enough because human beings have that innate need for some kind of spirituality yeah well it's, it's built into the brain of well most of us anyway but right. you are. You're seeing like a lot of like folk horror revival and seventies kind of occult movies coming back and people oh, yeah. are they're just uh, and they're practicing whether they're practicing in a group or they're practicing solo and they're hiding it. Like I just I, I thought the lady upstairs for me that owns this property was, was a Christian and then I, I thought I smelt something burning today. And I start texting her like, What's going on? And she's like, I'm smudging. I'm like, Oh, I didn't know you did that and she's like, Oh yeah, I just try to hide it and so i'm like wow but she was always you know presented like she was a christian but here she is smudging and doing all this stuff so i thought well that's interesting um, yeah these sort there's of an things amalgamation that, yeah. of beliefs yeah you know a lot of the charismatic you know aaron david will tell you this a lot of the charismatic beliefs charismatic christian beliefs are not too different from a form of animism or even some forms of occultism Mm-hmm. We some of the practices yeah i know and so that's interesting and they're i'm reading this again the the growing use of tarot cards and sorcery has sure. led to a new demand do you think maybe some people are doing this stuff and then they're also having this confliction that it's bad and or, or do you think they're really possessed or is it just in their mind and they're conflicted and they think it's bad and so they need someone to help them well i think i think there's a lot of things going on and that's some of it i mean Look! Look at the "everything is demons" crowd that we've we've dealt with pretty <laughs> constantly. Um, you know, I mean, and I, I think yeah, some people have been raised, especially if you've been raised Catholic. It seems it's really hard to shake that. So then you start doing, you know, you're playing with a Ouija board or something like that, and something weird happens, and you, you know, internally, unconsciously start building that into something it's not, you know, because you start wondering, did I, did I wake something up? Did I bring something in? Did I do something I wasn't supposed to? What am I going to do? Yeah. And we, and we can, yeah. I mean, we can affect our own health. It's not like that's not a thing. 
And meanwhile, you got these ghost shows that are saying, be careful what you're doing because you might bring Beelzebub into your house when you're playing with a Ouija board. board. Yeah. Yep. You know? Which, those shows kind of work on this kind of strange quasi-Catholic Christian level with this stuff almost. Like, they're all trying to be, they're all trying to have that same theme that The Exorcist has. That fascination with the evil side and then mixed with the the religious side as well. There's, yeah. There's an interesting dichotomy there with some of the psychology of these shows. Yeah. Like, um, what was it? The, you know, John Zaffis, the haunted collector, you know, it's all, all oh. that stuff in the war. It's all that stuff comes from this, this really ultra Catholicism, you know, this mm-hmm. staunch mm-hmm. stuff. Wow. Yeah, that that it does. Um, okay, let's see. There was something else I was going to say about that whole thing, but I don't remember what it was. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Gone. <laughs> de- next, demons. Next start. Demons. 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 I'm still the waiting on Tim. Get away. <laughs> I'm still waiting on Tim to make that shirt, man. Everything is demons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I told him I'd wear it. And you know, I mean, the people who will say that, I mean, they believe that. They're they're not just trying. They're not being trolls or anything. They really do believe that all this stuff is demonic. And they're all, they're also fascinated by it too. Well, sure. And you can you can make <laughs> if if you take that idea that everything is demonic, you can fit anything into it. But it doesn't prove it's demonic. I mean, you could say everything is aliens. And you know, fit everything into that paradigm too if you twist. Um, and I have a I have a friend who was doing actually taking clients on in an exorcism sort of way, and she sort of mentioned it to me. And I'm like, oh, do they have any mental illness? I don't think she liked me saying that, but mm. it's it's the first thing obviously I'm going to look at and say because because like even at the end you should like people can die. And you should be make sure you cover, you know, the basis of what they could have. But yeah, you know, she says it was real, and and the people couldn't afford to have anyone come in, and that she was counseling them and 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 going for it. I'm, you know, I don't know if it was or not, but she's actually. It was funny because she used to do just tarot cards and stuff, and she has people that were coming to her for exorcisms. But she wasn't even a, a priest or anything Catholicism. She was more into like, you know tarot cards and readings and stuff like that so and i totally forgot about that when we we started doing this but just popped into my mind that even people who aren't catholic are are getting people who are asking for blessings or exorcisms or shamanic rituals well i think take things away we're we're kind of we've kind of focused a lot on on catholics probably because of talking about the last story yeah Yeah. but a lot of this is going on in more of the kind of like evangelical and Pentecostal realm. Mm-hmm. A lot of it, you're seeing a lot of this stuff happening in Africa now. And that's, that's not really Catholic. That's more Pentecostal. I mean, there's people out there that think they can raise people from the dead and weird stuff like this. Mm. So there's a lot of weird stuff out there. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. Well, yes, and that's what our th- shows thrive on. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know if you if you made the comments. Um, oh man, I already forgot what the comment was. I remembered a few minutes ago, and now mm. I don't know what it was. Oh, uh, ghost hunting. That uh, when when uh, houses are, you know, when they they exercise the house or whatever, activity tends to ramp up. Whereas, like, if uh, a shaman or someone comes in and and clears the house. That's usually what gets a better response from things. Interesting. I, I didn't. I had never. I'd never thought about that. But um, I, I thought Adam was the one that pointed that out, but maybe not. Hmm. Well, that I don't know. That that does. You do see that sometimes, right? Like yeah. where they yeah. they do this exorcism or they do a blessing, and it just ends up making the thing mad and uh yeah but how much i don't know how much of that stuff is anecdotal though i, I true i true. don't know 
Um, and if it's coming, you know, if it's a poltergeist case, you're saying and it's coming from somebody. I mean, a lot of times at that right. point, that stuff gets very blasphemous. So unconsciously, that person may just be feeding back what, you know, they think they're supposed to be feeding back, even though they're, I say they in sort of the unconscious way, you know. Yeah, also, especially if, especially okay. if it's a bratty teenager. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like, if you look at, like, I don't know how exorcisms are necessarily done. I'm sure they're a lot more calm than, you know, in the, the power of Christ compels you sort of scenario. But if, if you have um, a, an approach where you're like, get out, get out kind of thing, as to an a, a different approach where you're like, hey, we're just healing a part of you. And we're going to make you whole, like maybe a softer, more holistic approach. Maybe that's the difference. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there's, well, a, psychological, okay. there's a psychological approach to it as well. Mm -hmm. I think as long as it doesn't become dangerous, like in the case of Annalise Michelle, yep. or the case in New Zealand, which there's an excellent documentary on that I've forgotten the name of, uh, that's on Netflix that is very, very well made, which was basically more about mass hysteria than it's about exorcism. Yeah. Which I, th which I think is another element of this and the power of belief. Oh, yeah. No doubt. I think we talked about that that documentary before on the show. We might have. Might yeah, I have. think so. It's it's where that that whole um, villager that community believes that that per, that person is possessed. Yeah, they were they right. were Maori in yes. New Zealand. Yes. They had the, this. They they kind of they were they were Christian, but they still held on to their traditional beliefs as well. So they could they had a. Mm -hmm. They had an amalgamation between those two belief systems, and they believed that there was this water demon that was in this woman, and they kept pouring water on her constantly, and eventually she drowns. Mm -hmm. And eventually, then they they think it went into the a, a thirteen year old girl, and they're pouring water on her, and she almost dies. Wow! And and it's just uh, yeah, bizarre. I mean, true story. I mean, yeah. it's 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 recreated in the in the documentary, but you know you see the actual people at the end of the news footage, and I mean it's, and and they had it, they basically it was almost like brainwashing, like they kept the kids in the house without any use of facilities, and the whole family is just it's it's just a circle, you know, that's belief system. Every it's it's like an infection spreading to everybody. That they're all nobody is telling them stop, you know, <laughs> yeah. until it's too late. And when you get people like that too, I mean, they're they're because they're caught up in this belief system. They believe that, you know, what they're doing is to save this person's soul. So they're less concerned about what's happening to them physically on this plane because yeah. that's not what what you know in the end that's not what matters. Right. Yeah. And we don't know what really was wrong with the woman. I mean, she it, it seemed that she was maybe having some kind of psychotic episode. And she had been under some kind of form of stress. Or maybe she had be, uh, was becoming schizophrenic. Right. But, mm. but, just, but they interpreted it as being, uh, well, it's, it's a water demon. Yeah. That's unfortunate. So, to take a complete different turn from Yahoo!, uh, this has been posted, I, I've seen it pop up a bunch of times, it originally from the Atlantic. It's called, Was There a Civilization on Earth Before Humans? And uh, it starts off, uh, and let me see who actually wrote the article. It doesn't say. So that, that's cool. Let me go to the Atlantic version of the article since I'm on the Yahoo version. Adam Frank is the name of the guy who wrote, wrote the article. And it starts off with uh, him interviewing Gavin Schmidt, who is the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And uh, he says, uh, I forget exactly what he was going in to talk to him about, uh, but Gavin throws to him, uh, how do you know we're the only time that, that we're the only time there's been a civilization on our own planet? And apparently this is something that just completely Completely. Oh, it was, uh, it was, he was talking to him about climate change, uh, and it completely blew him away to even consider this this possibility. But I mean, 
you have a, a large time span on this planet that we know nothing about. We have very little evidence for anything. And, uh, you know, when you, when you look at the work of people like Graham Hancock and John Anthony West and Andrew Collins and Robert Schock and all these other alternative ar- archaeologists, they make a very good case for a Ice Age civilization. Uh, I believe Robert Baval pushes it back to 30,000 years ago. Um, Mm -hmm. And Michael Cremo goes back millions of years with some of the stuff he has uncovered. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. I was going to bring up Cremo, yeah. (laughs) And I think Cremo's really interesting uh, because his work is... Even though he's he's coming from he's what a Hare Krishna is that what it is he's a well I think he's a Hindu I don't know if he's a Hare Krishna but I think I, he's yeah it's it's a sect of Hindu whatever it is yeah. but, uh, the books he was reading the religious books he was reading were saying that you know mankind had been here for millions of years and he went to his teacher and he said well this contradicts science how how do we you know how do how am I supposed to kind of bring this together in my own mind and his teacher said, well, I think you should go out and see if there's any evidence for it. And if there's no evidence for it, then our books are wrong. Which is, you know, the, the best answer he could have possibly given him, I think. Um, so, so Cremo started looking at the archaeological evidence and found that there's a lot of stuff that, you know, as Charles Fort would put it, was kind of damned. It was uh, just kind of left off to the side because it didn't fit with the, the current belief system of how things work. And you see it occasionally you'll see articles pop up where, you know, someone's found footprints in volcanic, you know, uh, like lava and stuff that's, that's hardened. And it'll be like, oh, we found ancient footprints. And then they'll, they'll date the ancient footprints and find out they go way further back than they should. And then they go, I guess they weren't footprints. Wow. So it's, it's like, no, no, you said they were footprints. You can't just yeah. throw that out now. Yeah. yeah, and interrupted their narrative a little bit. Wow. Or the, 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 the infamous comment that uh, Graham Hancock liked to repeat, from, I, f- I forget what the, what the subject was, but it was something about uh, the timeline of ancient Egypt where the archaeologists said, well, your facts disagree with our theories, so your facts must be wrong. Huh. That's <laughs> interesting. Because he, he was doing a, some, a lot of stuff about the Sphinx, wasn't he? Well, that was Robert Schock and... John Anthony okay. West, but okay. I think that I think okay. that's actually what it was in reference to that that Graham was talking about. Yeah, um, that's disturbing, but yeah. So in in this article, he talks. This guy, you know, uh, Schmidt here talks about it. You know how even our civilization, there would be nothing left after a certain period of time. There are certain signs we could find if we were looking for them, but we would have to know what to look for. Yeah, which was kind of which was kind of depressing, a little bit. I don't know about that. We 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 would just be like this like uh, line of black in the middle of a yeah. rock, you know, the whole all <laughs> well, of civilization. Says, um, n- now that our industrial civilization has truly gone global, humanity's collective activity is laying down a variety of traces that will be detectable by scientists a hundred million years in the future. The extensive use of fertilizer, for example, keeps 7 billion people fed, but it also means we're redirecting the planet's flow of nitrogen into food production. Future researchers should see this in characteristics of nitrogen showing up in sediments from our era. Likewise, our relentless hunger for the rare earth elements used in electronic gizmos. Far more of these atoms are now wandering around the planet's surface because of us than would otherwise be the case. They might also show up in future sediments, too. Even our creation and use of synthetic steroids has now become so pervasive that it, too, may be detectable in geological strata 10 million years from now. Um, and he continues on about plastic and stuff like that. But the, the point he's making is that even if they, they were able to notice these things, they wouldn't necessarily connect them to a civilization. Um, and they would have to be looking for them in the first place. Yeah. Um, so they, you know, there could have been, and that's, and, and that's the other thing when talking about ancient civilization, someone occasionally will throw out, well, where are the Coke cans? And it's like, so you think if there was an ancient civilization, they were just as wasteful and destructive as we are, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and maybe, maybe they were, I mean, who knows that maybe they weren't anything like humans at all. I don't know. Well, that's a possibility, too. Yeah. 
you know, we look, you know, we'll point to the fossil record and say, well, we would have seen something, but we're finding new things in the fossil record every day. The fossil record is like a tiny percentage of what was actually in the, you know, the history. Fossils are created under very specific circumstances. So there's, there's tons of things out there that we're never going to know about because they weren't fossilized. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, and of course, the blow off at the end of this is that, you know, well, I don't really believe uh, it says by asking about civilizations lost in deep time. We're also asking about the possibility for universal rules guiding the evolution of all biospheres and their creative potential, including the emergence of civilizations. Uh, even without pickup driving Paleocenians, we're now only now learning how to see how rich that potential might be. Um, it seems to me like this was more like a mental exercise. Yes, exactly. To, to exactly. see how, what the lasting effects of our civilization would possibly be on this planet. Right. And there was a show on, I think they made a series out of it at some point, called uh, Life After Man or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. And the, the initial movie they made was kind of like breaking down what would happen if man disappeared today. And I think by like 10,000 years, they were like, there would only be a few things still standing. Like there's a dam, uh, one of the big dams out in the Midwest, and like the pyramids. Yeah. Would be Any, like the, anything made of stone would still be standing. <laughs> right. And, and even, the, even the, uh, the big dam would eventually crack because of all the pressure from the water and stuff, but it would last a very long time. Um, and ironically, life, the pyramids. Life after you know, people is what that was called. That's it. Yes. 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 And it's always and, amazing how fast nature just cracks on in and takes over. It's like, oh, you thought yeah. you could hold it back. <laughs> yeah. So, like the church, like the uh, villages around Chernobyl that are abandoned. Yes. Virtually yes. reclaimed Those... by nature. Yeah. And now take take a look at you know the end of the last ice age, which was very traumatic and very uh, uh, cataclysmic. And consider if there was a civilization here, it could have been a very fairly advanced civilization it would have wiped almost everything out i mean that that stuff there are a lot of different theories on what exactly happened but the even the the most conservative scientists are acknowledging that the end of the ice age was a very sudden thing it wasn't something that happened over you know initially they thought a very long period of time of slow warming they're slowly starting to admit that the warming happened very, very quickly. They don't really know why. Yeah. Uh, I believe the official stance is it was something extraterrestrial, not as an alien, you know, like intelligence or anything like that, but like an asteroid or something else hitting the planet. Uh, Robert Schock suspects it was a uh, solar flare hitting us dead on, uh, entirely possible. Um, personally, I, I'll, I'll go with the electric universe idea that it was Venus moving too close to the planet. Um, I'll go with, Rand I'll go with Randall's, um, idea about the comet. I'm mm -hmm. thinking more and more. That's what it was. Yeah. Well, I, th I think there was a, I, the way I look at it is I think that Venus was a comet along with a lot of other cometary to debris. And I think that the lesser dryas was caused by a cometary impact. And then the actual meltdown was caused by a, a thunderbolt-like plasma uh, blast from Venus moving too close. Uh, the interesting thing that I've always thought about is that it's generally said that Cro-Magnon, man, of the 300,000 years, that's actually, uh, you know, I think we emerge as uh, modern man, so Homo sapiens sapiens. Or, or woman, as the case may be. Sorry, Melissa. Oh, no problem. And, uh, <laughs> Don't worry. So, I'm all good. So modern humans, you know, Cro-Magnons, they say is 35,000 years. So even if we take 35,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, that's still 25,000 years in which something could have, somebody could have built a civilization that could have yeah. come and gone. Yep. And we've, we we've, have... we've only been around in recorded history for 5,000 years. And, I mean, we can't even remember half the time our most recent history. People forget so fast, so, you yep. know. And, if, and, and like I said, if the end of that civilization was a cataclysm that caused massive flooding and sea level changes, you know, Graham Hancock has stated repeatedly, most of that civilization probably sits at the ocean floor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
because yeah, so much of, I mean, you know, Britain was once connected to the rest of, of Europe. Yeah. The North there, Sea, where the North Sea is, was all land at one time before the there, ice and, inundated and, it. And they're finding structures down there as well. Yep. Uh, there is also, and this, this, this is one of those things that always irks me. So uh, and I forget which book it was. I think it was in Underworld. Um, Graham talks about this legend of these temples being off the coast of India. And how like the, the one that stands there now is like the seventh temple or whatever. The others have all been inundated. Uh, and this is, I think, down where it connects to what's the little uh, island off the coast of, uh, not little, it's a fairly big island off Sri the coast Lanka. of India. Yeah, that was, that was once connected. So I believe as the sea levels right. rose, these temples uh, were covered over by the ocean. And they built a new temple. And then that would get covered over by the sea level rise. And then they'd build another temple. And officially, archaeologists said, no, these temples never existed. This is nonsense. They're just, it's just a story. And then we had that tsunami back in, I don't remember what, 2003 or something like that, or 2005, that huge tsunami that right. hit the whole area. Yeah. And uh, it uncovered one of those temples. Wow. And it, was, and it was big news, you know, ancient temple uncovered by tsunami. And I'm thinking, where, where's Graham Hancock's credit? Because I'm not seeing anyone giving Graham credit pointing this out. <laughs> That's, yeah, because um, the water receded and all went to Indonesia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, well, I, I, I think it actually just it unburied some of it and actually left it unburied. <laughs> yeah. However, it shifted everything around. Right. Um, so this, you know, to, to think there was there was other civilizations, I would say it'd be weirder if there weren't. It's just they may not have been like us. No. Yeah, and they may have, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I think we think there's only one way that people can progress, and it's this way of technology and, and such that we have today, and it's just one of of infinite number of paths. Well, right. and, that, and that's what I, I was going to mention, and what you know, just because they didn't have all the technology, it doesn't mean they didn't have a different way of communicating, and um, other than cell phones and you know doesn't mean right. we're in advanced um, I, I don't know could is psychic communication possible between other species can they you know are they able to exist with um not as much substances i mean we don't know that, and, and, like and, that could have happened and that could go into the whole uh idea that walter crutton has about the uh well not has that he brought forth about the uh the golden age being in a time period where we were almost like superhuman and could communicate telep with telepathy and stuff. And then, you know, we lost those abilities as we moved further from the, the source of whatever it is that uh, set off those, those abilities. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that Atlantis is kind of a composite of many different civilizations that have risen yes. and fallen. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's what it is. And, you know, uh, the, the, the new version of Battlestar Galactica played with this concept. Of course, that was in space. Right. But, you know, the whole idea that these civilizations have risen and fallen and have, in that respect, kind of taken a similar path. Everything's cyclic. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's um, that's the other thing too is, I think we're fascinated with those stories because we're sort of trying to figure out our own ending or where where it's all leading for us. Right. Yeah. And and most ancient cultures talk about civilizations that existed before our current one. Mm -hmm. It's just that you know our 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 science says, well, that's ridiculous. They're they're just again they're just making up stories. They don't. This it's myth. Yeah, because they, they never want to go out on a limb. Well, that's true too, and and they need the evidence to support it. But I don't think dismissing it is the right way of treating it. Yeah, you know, we've seen we've seen so many times that these, you know, supposedly uh, myths have turned out to have basis in fact. Yeah, you know, even even the the flood. You know, the flood myth in the Bible, although I doubt it happened anything like the story in the Bible, I think that's probably related to the end of the Ice Age with the meltdown, the sudden meltdown of flooding. And if, if it, it, I, I think if it got hit by any kind of 
planetary, uh, like a meteor or a comet or something like that, or if it got hit with any kind of electrical burst that melted that that uh, those ice those, the uh, the glaciers quickly. Yeah. Either one of those could have caused an immense amount of rain across the planet for a very long period of time because it all would have gone up into the atmosphere. Well, yes. think about it this way. Gobekli Tepe is not far from Mount Arafat, is it? No. Yeah, exactly. It's not. So I, th- I think what we're getting in some of these stories, you know, is, is, a, is, is glimmers of something that really did happen. It's a, it's dear, just, it's a dear memory. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. Right. and of course it's not going to be as it happened because, I mean, these things are going to be transferred f- to other places through orality. They're, you know, nothing is written down, so it's going to be told as myth, as story. You know, I, I th- yeah. I think I think the oral traditions are probably more accurate than the written ones because once <laughs> they get written down in the organizations like the church start getting yeah, a hold of them, that's that's side. when they start getting yeah. yeah, that's when they start getting twisted and, and used for political purposes. It's, yeah, as, as opposed to, like, the, like the, the native tradition here would have been orality, and it's fascinating to hear some of their, their myths and how they relate to exactly what happened in their history. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we are just about out of time. So uh, let's, uh, Adam, tell people where they can find you on a regular basis. Well, conspiranormal. Uh, conspiranormal.com, uh, conspiranormal.podomatic.com. And we are going to be doing some experiments. We're going to be starting to live stream on Facebook the show as well. So check that out on the Conspiranormal. Conspiranormal. Fa- Conspiranormal what? We cut we out, there. out there. Oh, the- oh okay. Facebook page. Yeah. All right. And Melissa, people can find you where? Well, I've been spending all my time with um, my partner in crime, my little business partner, John Chadwick, on our podcast, video cast that we're developing called ESP, Extrasensory Productions. So that is www.espirit.tv. Um, it's m- very visual, so it's on YouTube. Um, ESP Extrasensory Productions, you can type in, but we're also putting it on podcast form, and so it's on Podbean, and when I get a breath of time, I will have it on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play, and it's also going to be on Spotify uh, in audio, so that's where we are, and that's what we're doing. Right. Yeah. All right, well, I thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And a special thanks to our Patreons who are pledging $10 or more. William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Allison Cook, Christopher Vaughn, Robert Groom, Scott Morris Everett, Chris Elmquist, Supa Inframan, Russell Wilcoxon, Patricia Gaiaquinta, John Eddy, Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Schreck, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.